38 million years ago, global temperatures were much higher than today. The polar ice caps had melted and the Florida Peninsula was totally underwater. Beneath this shallow warm sea, sediments and seashells were deposited on the ocean floor. Over thousands of years, the shell remains of billions of little creatures were compacted into limestone. During the last glacial period, a good portion of the Earth's water was frozen and oceans receded. During this era, the Florida shoreline was actually some 300 miles further out. Sands and clay were deposited on the limestone. A remarkable variety of natural habitats began to develop. These diverse landscapes include alluvial streams, floodplain forest, limestone bluffs, spring-run streams, upland hardwood forest, floodplain swamps, upland mixed forest. There are aquatic caves in the park, which contain permanent pools and flooded passages, and terrestrial caves, which are relatively dry. All of these diverse areas provide important homes to over 600 different kinds of plants and more than 200 animal species. The caverns in this park offer a unique opportunity to look at Florida from the bottom up. The park's caverns are located within a geologic formation known as karst. Karst is a type of landscape characterized by an underlying layer of limestone with numerous sinkholes, caves, springs, and underground streams. Like a rock sponge, the porous limestone holds water that seeps into the ground from rainfall and surface runoff. This underground water storage area, or aquifer, is the source of water for the area's springs and also supplies us with our drinking water. Cave drip formations are typical of limestone caverns throughout the world. As gravity moves water downward from the forest floor to the cave, calcite crystals are deposited on the cave ceiling and floor. Stalactites are icicle-like formations of calcite hanging tight from the ceiling of a cave. In contrast to a stalactite, a stalagmite is blunt and rounded. Often a stalactite growing downward meets a stalagmite growing upward and they join to form a column. It takes approximately 100 years to form one cubic inch of calcite. When it first forms, water drips through its center, depositing rings of calcite around the tip. As it grows, the center becomes solid and water drips along the outside of the stalactite, depositing additional layers of calcite. Life inside a cave is quite different than life above ground. Cave residents are especially adapted to living in these unique areas of the cave. These areas vary from bright sunlight and variable temperatures at the cave entrance to total darkness and constant temperatures deep within the cave. Cave animals that must leave the cave to find food are likely to occupy a zone near the entrance. Other animals never leave the cave, spending their entire lives in the zone of total darkness. Florida Caverns has several species of bats, with the most common the eastern pipistrelle. Using their ultra-sensitive sonar systems, bats are able to fly through a maze of jagged cave formations in total darkness. Mother bats usually have one baby per year, which can fly in about three weeks. Worldwide, there are nearly 1,000 different kinds. They play a vital role in controlling insect pests. A bat consumes up to one half of its body weight in insects every night. The cave roosting bats of Jackson County alone rid the area of about 240,000 pounds of insects each year. Cave crickets leave the cave at night to forage for food. However, their droppings, eggs, and dead bodies are an important source of food for other cave animals. Cave crayfish are found only in permanently flooded caverns. These small, white creatures are blind and spend their entire lives in complete darkness. The white, blind cave salamander lives in clear cave pools and streams in complete darkness. The slimy salamander, after hatching, heads for the cave entrance and seeks shelter in the forest floor. The wood, or pack rat, lives near the cave entrance in a large nest of sticks and leaves. About 10,000 years ago, native people settled in the area. The park's caves, although not used as permanent homes, provided Native Americans with shelter from the weather and protection from enemies. They lived off the bounty of the land, 
hunting animals and gathering edible plants in the woodlands. These original settlers stayed near the cave entrances, which were drier and better lighted than the interior. Clay in the caves provided a useful raw material for creating pottery. Pottery fragments, tools, and the remains of two native village sites have been discovered within the park's boundaries. The Chatot, who were occupying the area when the Spaniards arrived, made and used the pottery and tools on display in the visitor center. Some of these pottery fragments and tools were found at a small village site near the visitor center itself. These stone artifacts are examples of coastal plain chert, a type of rock used by Native Americans to make a variety of stone tools such as knives or spear points. Native Americans inhabited this area for about 10,000 years before Spanish missionaries arrived in the 1600s. Settlers began arriving in this area from Georgia around 1817. These early pioneers were poor farmers who lived off the land. They created simple farms and built houses now known as cracker homesteads. The region's stately oaks and pines provided the wood for one and two room houses. Windows were simply openings in the walls with no glass. People who lived in rural Florida were called crackers, possibly named after the sound of the cracking whip that drove cattle and oxen. One of the cash businesses settlers pursued in the 19th century was extracting resin or gum from local longleaf pines. This product, known as naval stores, was used for the construction of wooden ships. This sticky pine gum was boiled and distilled into rosin, tar, pitch, and turpentine. After the Civil War ended in 1865, the turpentine boom provided jobs for former slaves. In 1929, the stock market crash was followed by the Great Depression. Widespread unemployment affected the entire nation. In 1935, Dr. J.C. Patterson, a physician from Florida, purchased 494 acres of land containing the natural bridge over the Chipola River. An avid cave explorer, Dr. Patterson took a lighted tour of caverns in Virginia and began to see the potential for a major cave attraction in Mariana. The caverns got a big boost from President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal policy. The Civilian Conservation Corps, or CCC, was one of the most effective programs of this era and began operations in Florida in 1933, inspiring the creation of a state park system. The Works Progress Administration, or WPA, also helped construct recreational facilities, including the development of a scenic nine-hole golf course located at the Florida Cavern State Park. Inside the cave, you can still see where men labored by hand to dig out trails and chisel tunnels through solid limestone. Workers who first crawled into the confusing maze of passages, some less than 12 inches high, were called the Gopher Gang. The Gopher Gang discovered a low room containing deer skeletons, plus footprints of Native Americans and black bear. As work on the caverns continued, a federal fish hatchery was created on the west side of the park. He had operated only a few years before closing down. Today's surviving evidence of the hatchery consists of the old earthworks, concrete floodgates, pump house, and a stone building. Florida Cavern State Park officially opened to the public in 1941, and work by the CCC came to an abrupt end with America's entry into World War II. In 1965, the Florida Park Service began a major expansion, opening up the entire western half of the park with a paved road and two bridges across Muddy Branch and Log Run on the Chipola River. A public boat ramp, camping area, and the Blue Hole swimming area were also constructed, along with a bathhouse and picnic pavilion. In 1988, a ribbon-cutting ceremony marked the opening of an equestrian center at the park. Developed in 1999 as an extension of the equestrian trail, the Chipola Recreational Trail System now extends onto the property of the Northwest Florida Water Management District. The Florida Caverns State Park is a fragile ecological system which currently has many threats. Pollution from industrial and agricultural sources can contaminate underground water, especially in a cave-rich environment. Every time it rains, pollution from fertilizers, pesticides, animal waste, and other contaminants are washed underground in the form of runoff. These contaminants can pollute our underground cave systems, springs, and streams. Chemicals and pesticides can threaten aquatic caves, their inhabitants, and even the purity of well water. 
Another threat are thoughtless individuals who would destroy or vandalize our caves. Most of the beautiful geologic formations that once existed in the Miller's Cave have been destroyed. This cave now has been fenced off and is slowly healing itself. For their protection, many caves surrounding the park have now been closed off, making the park's protected caves even more important for animals. Here are some small things we can all do to help protect our parks. Conserve water. Don't waste it. Reduce or eliminate the use of fertilizers and pesticides. Dispose of household cleaners, motor oil, batteries, and other chemicals at designated hazardous waste collection sites. Repair your vehicle's oil and fluid leaks immediately. Remember, one gallon of gasoline can contaminate one million gallons of water. Properly maintain your septic system. Do not use sinkholes as a place to discard trash or waste. And finally, educate and inform others about these threats. The modern day Florida Park Service works to protect and preserve the fragile, natural, and cultural resources of the park while promoting public use and recreation. We can all be good stewards in protecting our fragile environment for generations to come.